Hello, I'm Chris Petraskevich, president of the University of Evansville, and welcome to our 2021 baccalaureate service. Baccalaureate service goes back as far as 1432 in Oxford, and some 589 years later, we continue to celebrate together as a university community before we begin our commencement exercises. You know, many times people think about commencement as an end in the process. But of course, commencement doesn't mean an end of the process, it means the beginning of a process. And so how can you have convocation in the beginning and commencement at the end? And that is because commencement is a continuation of being able to make a difference in our world and being able to make a difference in our community. So instead of looking as baccalaureate service and commencement as the end of a process, we look at commencement and baccalaureate services as the beginning of a journey, the continuation of a journey, the continuation of what happens at the University of Evansville so that later in the process, we're able to work together to be able to have our communities, our society come together better. One of the most important aspects of thinking about a baccalaureate service is thinking about the United Methodist Church and the long history of the University of Evansville with the United Methodist Church. One of the things that we think about most often when we think about a service such as this is how does the education of someone at the University of Evansville, of our students at the University of Evansville, happen over the course of four years? The most important part is that we don't think of education just happening in the classroom. Education is the learning of the mind, it's the learning of the body, and it's the learning of the spirit. In other words, it is the education of the whole person. And that becomes really important when we're talking about the first pandemic that has happened in 100 years. As we think about the education of the mind, the body, and the spirit, it helps us to begin to realize what the word resilience means and how it has an impact on all of us. If we just think back, oh, 14 months ago, when the first pandemic in 100 years began, and we know now, what we know then what we have known now, the question is whether we think at that point we would have been resilient enough. The answer to that question might have been some skepticism. Maybe it is the possibility that I'm not sure, as a person, as a community, as a society, we, have, we could have been resilient enough. What it has demonstrated 14 months later is that we have been so resilient. We have been resilient as a University of Evansville community. We have been resilient as a university community that is linked with our community in Evansville. And we have been resilient as a society. So as we begin to commence together, as we begin to go forward together, we take the lessons learned over the last year with all the resilience, with the education of the mind, with the education of the body, with the education of the spirit, and we work together to have a better future. On behalf of all of us, thank you for joining us for our baccalaureate service. Thank you for commencing with us, and we look forward to a very bright future. Thank you, President Petroskevich, for joining us for this very special baccalaureate service. And now, a reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter four. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. But woe to one who is alone and falls and does not have another to help. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one might prevail against another, two will withstand one. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And now I invite you to receive this message from our university chaplain, Andy Payton. We all want to be happy, and we all are looking for a sense of joy. Ask any parent, grandparent, or a person with the moral compass uh, what they hope for the next generation is, and they will probably respond by saying they, they want their kids, their grandkids, and the people coming after them to be happy and to have a better life than they did. Ask any student about ready to graduate from university or high school, and they will also tell you that they're longing for a sense of joy. The problem is, of course, we don't all define joy or happiness in the same way. And then, once we find it, it seems elusive and hard to hold on to. 
Fortunately, we're not the first people to ask this question about what it means to be happy or how to find well-being or a sense of joy. In fact, since the beginning of when we as a species started writing down our stories, we've been talking about this question, wrestling with it, and trying to find its answer. Take the writer of Ecclesiastes, for example. Just moments ago, you, you heard a, a reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, and tradition tells us that King Solomon, one of the most successful kings in all the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Old Testament, wrote it. Truth be told, we don't know exactly who wrote it, but I'm going to pretend like King Solomon is the one who wrote it. Another tradition even said that Solomon wrote a book called Song of Songs when he was young and filled with romantic passion. The book of Proverbs when he was middle-aged and trying to be practical. But he wrote Ecclesiastes when he was old and most of his life was lived. He is wrestling with this question about happiness in what he writes. And throughout the work, what we discover is he takes on different hypotheses about what it means to be happy. Now, for example, one of the things King Solomon considers is meaningful work. I mean, we've all been told meaningful work is what makes a person happy. All of us in our culture have been told that in a certain way. Solomon, when he talks about work, this is what he says. I considered all my toil, and it was vanity. A vexation, that's the word he uses. And I had to leave it to the people who came after me. Now, uh, to be fair, we all would like a job, and we all need a job, and doing a good job is something that is dignifying, and it is good for us. But I do think Solomon has a point. When we make work the center of our lives, at the end of our work, if you will, when we can no longer do, we retire. Quickly, people forget about us, and if we're not careful, it will not lead us to the happiness we long for. And here's another one Solomon considers. Stuff. I mean, we've all been told that more stuff will make us happy. And in Ecclesiastes, this is what Solomon says. The lover of wealth will not be satisfied. Those who go after money will not be fulfilled. Now again, to be fair, we all need a little bit of money in terms of fulfilling our basic needs. But again, Solomon has a point stuff and money doesn't necessarily satisfy us in the long run. Study after study has been done on Western culture and American culture, and it is said that we consume a vast majority of the world's resources, and yet we are one of the most depressed societies in the world. In fact, one report I read just recently said that we are number three on the list behind India and China as one of the most depressed societies in the world. Finally, pleasure. We've all been told that seeking after feel-good experiences is what makes us happy. Our culture teaches us this. And Solomon takes on this question too. And he says basically it's like chasing after the wind. The question really becomes, so what makes us happy? According to Ecclesiastes and Solomon, nothing. No thing. In his words, it's all vanity and meaningless. which. I admit, it's probably not what you expected to hear from your chaplain today. What he does say, though, is something entirely different. Instead of nothing or things making us happy, what he says is, in the end, it's relationship. That's that passage that you just heard moments ago. When two are better than one, and a cord of three is not easily broken. In the end, according to Solomon, it's not the stuff, it's not the pleasure, and it's not even status in the world that gives us the satisfaction we long for. Instead, it's relationship. But don't take Solomon's word for it. There's also Harvard. One of the longest studies ever done on the human species started in the 1930s. It was called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. They followed a group of graduates and throughout their entire lives, and they studied their well-being. And what they found was the one thing that determined it most was their sixth sense of connection and the quality of their connection they had with others. Or don't even take Harvard's word for it. Listen to your life for a moment. This past year, we have gone through something that none of us anticipated. We have gone through a global pandemic that has driven us apart and it has made us distant from one another. 
I can remember one of the first Zoom calls and Zoom meetings I had. And afterwards, I thought to myself, it was good, and I'm glad that we had the technology. But I remember saying to myself, it is not the same, and why? Because we are designed for relationship. We long for relationship. John Boehner, former Speaker of the House, probably said it quite well a couple days ago when he noted a man or a leader without a leader without followers is just a man taking a walk, I would add. A person without relationship is going nowhere good. I pray for you on this day. And here's what I pray. I pray that you have success. I pray that you get stuff. I pray that in the days ahead you experience pleasure. But more than that, I pray that these things wouldn't get you so far ahead of yourself that you miss the one thing most important, relationship. For two are indeed better than one. Amen. Will you please join me for a moment of prayer? Gracious and loving Creator, we thank you for all the guidance, care, and the challenges you have given to these graduates during their years in college. We thank you for family members, alumni, and many generous anonymous others who made this time possible. We thank you for faculty, mentors, and peers who helped shape them into the people they are today. Lord, may you walk ahead of and beside them as they step into the next chapter of their journeys. Equip them with courage and compassion. Inspire them with passion and creativity. Bless them with patience, humor, and self-forgiveness during inevitable failures. May they find their value not in what they do or what they own, but who they are. And most of all, grant them the kind of friendships that make this life worth living. Amen. To close our baccalaureate service, we'll light candles, one for the class of 2020 and one for the class of 2021, as a sign of our prayers and hopes for them and the light that they are carrying into the world.